So, at the interest of time, um, let me uh, start with um, uh, the session from today. First, again, welcome everyone for, uh, for joining us um, on this uh, webinar and dialogue with um, uh, our special guest, uh, Nuno Gonzalves. Um, I'm delighted that he will uh, join us today and he will give a sh very short presentation. Um, and then we will have an opportunity to do a Q &A and A uh, and 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 learn more about you know his his thinking and what he's doing um, at the Mars Company. Um, um, just for you to know, uh, the session will be recorded. Um, we have we have a lot of people who typically uh, watch the recorded session. Um, this session will be published on the uh, website of the Center for Corporate Learning Innovation. So you can also, um, uh, you know, watch the recording uh, later if you uh, would like to. Um, as I mentioned, um, we hope to uh, to to get you know to get your questions today. So please uh, use the chat uh, for any any questions you have. But also in the meantime, if you are listening, you have a comment or a, an idea or a thought, you know, feel free to share it in uh, in the, in the chat. So. Um, what I will do is uh, I will um, um, I will walk you through a couple of slides, um, um, introduction, context, um, and then I will turn it over to uh, Nuno. I will introduce him at that point. We are changing slides. Um, then he will do a presentation, and again we have a Q and A. Uh, but just um, you know, for those of you who are uh, new to uh, to the session today, um, um, this session is organized by uh, the IE. Um, University Center for Corporate Learning and Human Resources. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be back in Madrid um, after being uh, in the Netherlands for quite some time. So back in Madrid, it's a wonderful day here. It's sunny. Uh, and I hope the also the place where you are dialing in from, it's a, it's a nice day as well. So um, uh, this uh, is organized by uh, the webinar by the IE Center for Corporate Learning Innovation and Human Resources. Um, um, Cristina Fernandez, who is uh, a director at the center, um, will share a couple of uh, thoughts on what we do. Um, so, uh, Cristina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nick. Welcome, Nuno. And, uh, well, it's great to be back at the office, as you can see here. And also great to be back at the Center for Corporate Learning and Human Resources, especially because these new times are bringing new challenges here. I don't know about you guys, we will discuss about it, but we are knowing, we are seeing how going back to the office is bringing some challenges and also some new ways to work, to lead, to coordinate. For instance, how to combine face-to-face -face with remote working, how to make it flexible, how to allow new spaces for collaboration, like physical spaces, but also time spaces, how L&D is going to cope with that and how companies are going to retain talent in this new environment. So the new series of webinars that we are having will tackle those, uh, those topics and much more. So 2000 people already in the, in the community and we are eager to have this new season beginning. Thank you so much. Nick Nuno. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Christina, for, for this heads up. And, um, and exciting news for some of you in the A and the L and D profession and, and leadership development profession. Uh, you might have seen um, a posting from myself that uh, uh, Jan Rijken uh, and myself have published a new book. Uh, it's available since two weeks on uh, Amazon. It's really a compendium for every L&D professional um, on very important topics, as you see here. Um, and all the royalties will be donated to the eLearning for Kids Foundation. So um, you can find the book on Amazon, of course, in a hard copy, but also in a Kindle version. So um, if you are dialing in and, you know, that's your, your background, um, you know, hope you will benefit from this book. Um, this topic today, we talk about, um, you know, an HR topic and the HR profession is changing under our hands. Um, um, there are a lot of exciting things that, um, you know, we need to do from an HR perspective. And also in my interaction with a number of CHROs uh, and business leaders, uh, this is the time for HR professionals, HR business partners, HR experts uh, to upskill and reskill ourselves. And therefore, I'm delighted to announce that uh, we will um, have a new program that we will kick off in January, the end of January, um, HR Leadership in a Digital Age. This is a six-month program 
Um, it's virtual. And at the end, we will have a, um, a three-day online, an, an immersive retreat in Spain, in Segovia, where we have a campus at the university. So um, if you're interested in learning more about this uh, program uh, on October the 6th, um, we will have an information session. Um, um, the head of the program advisory board is Nick Bressi, uh, former CHRO from Ahold del Has. Um, he will join another organization uh, shortly. It has not been announced yet, but uh, it will be soon. Um, then we have Costanza Citrini, and head of HR, also a lead, a lead faculty member. And we have Jan Rijken and myself. Uh, and then there are many other faculty members who are part of this, uh, this unique uh, program. So uh, anything you'd like to know about, please check in with us and uh, join the information session on uh, October the 6th. And finally, um, we are organizing every month uh, webinars um, similar to the one from today. Um, and as you see on this slide, uh, exciting things will happen uh, the rest of the year. Uh, in October, we will have uh, Stefan van Hooydonk. Um, who will talk about curiosity. He has done amazing uh, research work on this, on this uh, topic. Um, also in October, we have uh, Inger Boos, who's the just uh, a new global um, uh, leadership development officer at Capgemini to talk about you know, transforming the talents at Capgemini. Uh, in uh, November, we have Kelly Palmer, the CLO of uh, Degreed, uh, with a very interesting topic. Uh, and then finally, in, uh, in December, uh, we have a, a former colleague of mine and friend of mine, um, uh, Terry Hart, who has just published or will publish soon uh, a new book that she will um, discuss. It's all about, you know, learning. So that are, that's the plan for the rest of the year. So I hope that you will join other sessions. Uh, and with that, um, I will stop sharing here. Um, and I will uh, uh, give uh, Nuno the opportunity to, uh, to share his slides and to upload them. Uh, but in the meantime, um, what I'd like to do is to, uh, to introduce Nuno. Uh, Nuno is a an, an, an professional in, in HR, in learning, in talent and leadership development uh, for over 26 years. Um, he's currently the global head of strategic capability building at Mars. Uh, and he has also worked for a variety of other companies, including uh, the UCB, Sanofi, Solvay, Inatel, and he has always been in global international roles, uh, in HR roles, CLO roles, talent development roles. Um, and in addition to that, he's also a board member of the Josh Burson Academy. Um, you know, uh, Nuno, he graduated from, uh, from the university in, in Portugal. He has a, a bachelor in industrial and organizational psychology. He also completed a number of uh, uh, um, uh, postgraduate programs, including at, uh, at Stanford, uh, but on, with a focus on business and HR. And with that, um, I'd like to turn, um, turn it over to uh, Nuno to, uh, to share his stories and um, uh, and, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Nick. I uh, appreciate the introduction as well. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and Nick, when you were uh, asking whether um, I wanted to share some of my insights around this topic, of course, you know, I think before you went the sentence, I said, of course, um, because it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be uh, somehow also uh, among friends like you. I, I recognize some faces. Some, face, some faces of people that I've worked with and some, uh, and I'm very happy to actually have, uh, you know, it's, it's a perfect excuse to be uh, with these folks also for, for a little while. So um, thank you for having me. Um, and I think you also have a great panel um, coming forward. Kelly Palmer is a good friend um, and I'm sure she's, um, she's gonna bring uh, also brilliant insights as well. So uh, for the team. So um, the, challenge, the challenge that Nick um, has uh, given me was to talk a little bit about human-centered leadership um, and actually, we have one, one of, the, one of the, uh, the people that worked on this, on this research with us at the Josh Person Academy, also here, uh, Minu, if you want to also text back and, and provide your, um, your insights here, I think that would be great. Um, and this was a piece of research that we actually did in, um, uh, earlier this year. And as I went back in you know, a couple of weeks, um, um, a lot of, of the world has, has evolved. So, what I, what I want to share with you is a little bit of, of my thinking about the, uh, the, the future, um, some of the changes that we're seeing holistically, 
there's a lot of research being done from a lot of people, and probably some of some of those people are also in this in this call. Um, but I, I hope and I think that no one, none, none of us have um, the answer around, you know, what are uh, the skills that we're going to need in the future? What are the competences that we're going to need in the future? Um, one, you know, uh, because everything is changing to, at, a, at an unprecedented uh, pace. Um, I don't have a lot of slides. Um, we shared with you earlier today um, kind of the summary of the research. Uh, the research was, was, as, uh, was done uh, under the umbrella of a bigger um, initiative called the Big Reset, uh, where we had uh, hundreds of senior talent learning leaders, HR leaders, such as yourselves, trying to understand what was um, the impact of the pandemic, the impact of uh, all that, we, that is happening to us uh, doing today, and also what would that impact the future. So I don't know about you, but uh, for me, um, uh, I'm always trying to understand what the future looks like. It's my kind of my playground. It's I, I love to see trends um, and trying to not guess, but having educated uh, and informed uh, perspectives about the future. And that's that's a little bit of what I'm trying to do today. Um, you'll see in the slides that uh, first there's a there's a there's a first slide where I'll tell a brief story, and then we'll 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 go like six or seven slides around kind of data and insights because I think to for us to understand. Uh, what the, fu the future, or at least have a perspective of what the future looks like, um, we need to understand what's surrounding us, right? So I would love to share some, some of that, uh, of what I'm seeing. And throughout the, the, the presentation, I uh, would, would love to have your thoughts and, 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 uh, and questions also on the chat, uh, and even comments. So I'll, I'll be making some questions. So be uh, uh, to just to make sure that you guys are there to see if there's some, if we can have some interactivity also here. So. Um, I don't know if uh, you guys have met uh, Susan Cain or have read her book uh, called Quiet, um, but I, in preparing for this, for this conversation, I was thinking back on, on where I actually start getting even more taste about the future and probably starting having better educated perspectives about the future. And the first time that I truly realized that the world was multidimensional, because I think most, you know, before I was thinking, you know, one thing comes after the other, it's very linear, um, was when I actually read her book. It doesn't have anything to do with it because it doesn't have anything to do with, with HR. Now, what she says there, it's, it's a book called Quiet, the Power of Introverts um, in a world that can't stop talking, right? Uh, of course, Susan is, is, is high introvert um, and she was trying to understand the evolution, the, of course, the power of introverts and the, the, the contributions of introverts in society um, but trying to also to understand why this has changed. And a uh, really short story was uh, from her perspective back in, in, in the Industrial Revolution, and I promise this is not a, a, story, a history class, but in the Industrial Revolution, what happened, you had a lot of people coming from the small cities, from the farms to the big cities, right? And while before they had uh, probably their entire lifetime to be able to show who they were, right? Because you were the baker or you were the farmer um, and you lived with the same people, you know, your, your entire life. You had your entire life to demonstrate who you were um, and probably there, uh, the older you were became, becoming, uh, the more uh, character people were assigning to you one way or the other. So what she says was that with this industrial revolution, people coming from to the cities, um, you don't, uh, you don't have this the entire life again to be able to demonstrate your character. And the impact is that ultimately, because the world was running so fast, that you had much less time to be able to influence the others. And that's where she says there was a, a, a rebalance of the, and, and the, the extroverts started to gain some advantage, you know, compared with the introverts. The reason being is that they ultimately are able to normally and typically to be able to uh, demonstrate and show their personality much faster than the introverts, which at the end you might we might remember from the from the books that it was when we, we, you know the U.S. started to have these uh, uh, selling books, negotiation books, how to perform books, because that's what was important, what how you were showing up. So what she was saying there is that um, while before there was a cult, you know, a cult of character, right to to for you to become who you are and, and in society to actually be better seen in society throughout the 
your lifetime, it, it, it ended up being a cult for personality, meaning the, the people that were able to have a more outgoing personality and to show and to demonstrate and to influence the, world, the others fast were those that were um, somehow uh, being more successful in their, in their lives. Now, the question that I have right now, and I believe this is, a, this is an hypothesis that I have, is that we are already again on, on, a, on another pivotal moment where we're probably going to another type of uh, person, another type of leader um, that we will need and another type of organizations. And from everything that I'm hearing, uh, this purpose-driven organizations, this purpose-driven um, uh, leadership, this human-centered organizations and human-centered uh, leadership is something that seems to be um, one, certainly one of the one of the trends. So the question is ultimately, I think, um, for some of you is, and for me as well is, you know, uh, for the future that that will probably be a new future, as always, right, and evolving at an unprecedented pace. What are the skills we will need to succeed? What are uh, what is the leadership profile of the future for those of you that are in learning and development and talent development in HR, or even for uh, those of you that are in business? What are uh, if you're a leader, um, then what type of profile, what type of person will the world uh, uh, ask of you in in the future as well? So a few a few data points, um, and I think that when we start understanding and trying to understand the future, we also need to understand what's happening right now. Here's the thing, this is an economic view of the labor market. We have over 40% over of the workforce is considering leaving their employer in 2021. So, um, and I would, I'm not seeing the chat, but I would love for you to also to react to these, to these numbers. And you have the, the sources of this information also there. So this is one view, the view of the economic labor, uh, the, of the labor market. There's a, there's a workforce that is uh, looking for changes. 48% of America's working population is actively looking for job opportunities, which is outrageously high. You have- No, no, just one um, question. We are not seeing the slides. Could you please share them? Oh, well. <laughs> I, did, I did share my screen. So can you see my slides now? Yes, if you put it in the, in the whole presentation mode, there you go. Okay, so that was my first slide that you didn't see um, that was talking about Quiet and Susan McCain. So apologies for that and thank you, Christina, for uh, letting us know. Um, so please do react to this um, as well. I'll try to have the chat open. It's not, not always easier as well. So thanks so much, guys. So um, here's a perspective of the labor market, you know, numbers of this month. So I was collating this uh, also in the this uh, this weekend, so you have a workforce that is uh, that has taken the the COVID and the pandemic to reflect on their choices, and there you you start to see over forty percent of the workforce considering to leave uh, their employer. You have forty eight percent of America's working uh, population actively job searching and watching for opportunities. So there's a there's there's a lot of a, of movement expected moving forward. And if you actually, I just was seeing the, the US labor market, labor department uh, statistics, um, there's, uh, if we see since the beginning of the year, and, I, and I, I went to the US because it's also where we have a lot of mass in terms of employment, um, in a trend, in an average, more than 3 million people quitting their jobs every month. Um, last month, 3.9 million people uh, quit their jobs as well. The interesting thing uh, and concerning thing is that we seem to be see, to, to, to watch a trend where there's more departures of women than of men, which ultimately um, our hopes was to continue to balance uh, women and men in, in the organizations. There are some indications that this might be decreasing as well. Um, CEO, LinkedIn CEO saying that there's 8.5 times more remote jobs on LinkedIn since the start of the pandemic, which is a significant increase as well. In terms of GDP, we're seeing a world that is stabilizing again. And as you can see here on, the, on your right, uh, most of the, of the world is green, and that means that you have positive GDP results. Um, and uh, as you can see in the, in, the, in the lower part of the slide, um, attrition, the resignations are trending upwards as well. So, 
as you start to understand what will be the future um, uh, that we will have, it will certainly be a future of much more movements uh, and a future where attraction, retention, development of the talent will continue to be from our perspective, uh, something that is, that is very important. The fact that we've put the number here in terms of GDP is um, that there's a significant amount of money still floating on how to develop uh, the capabilities as well. And the 4 million is not only those that lost, it's actually voluntary, most of them voluntary separations, John. So, uh, which is even, even kind of more important. Um, and well, when I'll share the, uh, the, the slides, you'll see that uh, you'll have the links and you'll be able to see that for yourself as well. So unprecedented times, right? So uh, if we see other perspective, a view of the skills of the future, uh, World Economic Forum, this is well known for a few years, uh, say that uh, there's a 87 million jobs that will be lost through automation in the future. Uh, on the other side, the good news, 97 a million new jobs that demand skills that don't yet exist. So for us, learning and development, HR professionals, this is good news, um, but it does mean that we need to do something about this um, because we need to develop these, these skills um, in the future, uh, hoping that we understand which skills uh, we need to develop in advance as well. So 54% of all employees will require significant upskilling or reskilling uh, in just three years. That's again, well, well known. Um, on the other side, Microsoft, some of Microsoft research saying, you know what, uh, our employees seem overworked, uh, high productivity is masking an exhausted workforce. So uh, how are you gonna balance an exhausted workforce that still needs to upskill and reskill is something that we need to uh, consider uh, you know, in the future. Um, interesting numbers from HBR, and this has a, you know, it's uh, I think probably a couple of years old, but I think I wanted to bring this here uh, because 75% of uh, 1500 managers surveyed from 50 companies were dissatisfied with training programs. 70% of employees say they weren't taught the skills they needed to, to do their jobs. 12% of employees apply, uh, only apply what they learn uh, in training to their job, but yet, um, the, the interesting thing is that uh, the, the investment in learning continues to rise quite significantly um, to, uh, to an industry that is estimated to be roughly uh, uh, $350 billion uh, per year. Um, so the question is, what is the return that we have from all that uh, investment as well? Um, so, so what? Um, I think there's, um, there's uh, from a sociological view, I was trying to get some information and um, I couldn't resist the temptation to bring you and to probably seed your appetite to something that Mars has done um, back in 2008, which is the economics of mutuality. So if we see this kind of the world changing, the, economy, the economics changing, um, Mars, from my perspective, and I've only joined Mars uh, almost a year ago, um, there was a lot of foresight on what we, uh, what Mars was doing back in 2008. And mind you, 2008 was, uh, we were at the peak of the, of the economic crisis. And one of our board members um, came back and said, you know, but guys, what should be the right level of profit for any corporations? And we put, Mars has put together a team of economists and other people to try to come to bring another economic model uh, to the table. And if there's one thing that you probably want to see from this uh, after this presentation, um, go ahead and, 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 and just Google economics of mutuality or then use the link that I'll share with you guys. Um, the work that that team has done there has been phenomenal because uh, mutuality is one of the five principles at Mars. Um, and this economics of mutuality basically says that um, although before, and this is what, uh, you'll see also on the CEOs uh, after there, before the sole purpose of an organization was to bring shareholder value, mostly financial value. Mars at that time, and we continue to think like that, that we believe that value is, has, has multiple origins and multiple dimensions. And that we believe that the purpose of the companies and a purpose-driven company will, will ultimately provide value to different um, dimensions that you can see there in a so social view, human view, natural and financial view. So there's a lot of work being done there and somehow demonstrating that the companies that are um, giving value 
to and the, you know that are purpose driven companies that are providing value not only to their shareholders are companies that are much more sustainable moving forward and, and those that will be much more um, um, will be much stronger also in the future. So ten years later, almost the some of the CEOs that you see on the right actually formed a coalition of I think of, of 180 CEOs that and and they brought a manifesto to say that the, the the shareholder capitalism is is a model that needs to evolve, and the the purpose being it's not only about financials, it's not only pro to provide a financial return to. Uh, to the to the shareholders, but we need to provide value to customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and shareholders. The, on the right, you'll see um, some of the quotes of uh, some of the most successful people in the world. Um, Satya Nadella just uh, in his last interview saying, talking about care. Larry Fink, that is the CEO of BlackRock, um, the the biggest um, investment organization in the world. Uh, talking about sense of purpose as well. So there's a paradigm shift um, that we seem to be seeing from the old ways of doing business and the new ways of doing business. So as, as, um, as, as a consequence of all this, and I'll, I'll summarize in a little bit, we are all, and you can see here, and some of you I think are also from McKinsey and other organizations, we are all trying to understand what the future will look like and these are just, you know, things that we've been uh, hearing in the past uh, few weeks, right? So there's a new social contract. So the employees, what the employees expect from a company and what a company expects from the employees is evolving. Um, there's, there's these concepts of the great resignation because there's a tremendous amount of people quitting their jobs as we talked about. Others are seeing this as opportunities as McKinsey saying, you know, yes, it's great resignation for some, but for the others, it's it's great attraction. The same thing with Wilson Towers Watson. Um, Gallup sees more of a perspective of engagement. So um, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying right now to do uh, is, and what I tried to do, to do in these last four slides is to say, listen, it's not easy. It's not easy to understand everything that is going on an economical view, on a sociological view, on a corporation view, right? Um, the, 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 there are some trends and some, some insights and based on these insights, we do believe that we're evolving to a place where um, we, will, we will need different leaders um, and, and, uh, and leaders that will be much more uh, complete and multidimensional, not only leaders that are great financial leaders and, and, and performance drivers, but, but people, leaders that are purpose-driven and human-driven as well. Um, now this, and this is sometimes a myth that needs to be demystified, is that the fact that you care doesn't mean that you don't deliver Right, and I hope we, we all agree with that. It's uh, you can do both. Um, and one of the quotes that I like the most is uh, Ajay Banga. We you know when he was saying you know listen, uh, do well and do good is possible, and this that's what Mastercards uh, is is trying to do uh, as well. There. Any any questions so far, um, uh, team? That you want me to address? Uh, I have just two or three more slides uh, with information. Then we can open to. Q and A, but anything um, that is worth. Uh, yeah, up. Nuno, thank you, Nuno, for framing the, the context of, of um, you know big change. You know, we are we are living in a time of tremendous change, as you mentioned, and also looking ahead of us. One question in the chat is about you know what, why do we think that the, of course the people who can you know find another role are indeed quitting? Why is it is it only about purpose? Um, or are there other things that play a role? So, so we, don't, we don't know everything, all the reasons. Um, there's a few um, people um, that believe that the COVID has actually brought more time for reflection. Um, some of us, and, and, and it's sometimes even counterintuitive, um, although the, the, some, you know, there's, there's high levels of burnout, uh, the fact that you're spending more time with your family, the fact that you're spending more time with friends, um, even though, of course, inside of your own bubbles of, of restriction, um, has brought this, this higher level of reflection and uh, a perspective that there's something else different. I think that probably most of us two or three years ago um, didn't know that there was something different, uh, meaning that means working from home, working in a gig economy, and ultimately everything was accelerated. So um, 
the one of the things that I saw was that people like to have um, the power um, of choice of choosing whether they work remotely, of choosing who with whom they work with, uh, or choosing um, also in the industry and so on and so forth. So there's there's this part of reflection um, that I think is contributing. The other piece, and those are the two ones that I saw, is is the um, and that's where you see that there's more women somehow quitting their jobs, is that today in our, in our society, unfortunately, uh, some of the burden outside of the career is, is still in most cases more on women. And that's unfortunate, right? And that means that the, the levels of stress and burnout and sometimes the tough choices between um, the professional and the personal career lay more on women than, than on men. And that might be one of the reasons why there's, there's also so much um, so much turnover and resignation, but uh, I'm very open to other other perspectives as well, um, because I don't think none none of us have a clear clear answer there. Yeah, I have one other question, um, but maybe you you tackle this, um, uh, you know, in the next slide. So so people are asking, well, you know, you make the point for you know different leadership in organizations, purposeful driven leadership, uh, um, human human centered leadership. The topic of the presentation today. I assume you will you will talk about it in a second, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So I would say let let's let's continue. Then we have questions at the end of the uh, the session again. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nick. So so yeah, um, just real quick. Um, pieces and nuggets of information that I think are important. I don't want to overwhelm you guys, but this is some of the areas of impact of, uh, of this pandemic that we're in the world where we are right now, where um, there's, there's a, a, obviously dimensions that are impacting the health and well-being, um, our agility and, in, you know, and, and the business, the transformations, the reinventions of work and all that stuff that you can see there, but also on the other side, a significant amount of communication overload so we seem to be kind of burdening our uh, our organizations. And the interesting thing, and I love this part on the right on the right side on the bottom, is that once when surveying different people in the organizations, most of the business leaders say that they are thriving, but but they seem to be kind of the the only the only ones the only ones there. So the, I will also share some you know the the the, the research that um, that uh, that was done on on this one. Um, there's an interesting. Uh, uh, construct that was built by by Josh Burson and some of you know him really well. He's one of the top analysts, or probably, and I'm biased. I think he's the best analyst, um, the HR analyst and business analyst in the world, from from my perspective. Uh, and uh, he has coined this this irresistible organization concept back when he was at Deloitte, and he actually went back and and brought it back again, because everything that he's seeing in terms of best practices of com of companies that are attracting more talent. There's, there's also a pattern there. And I think one of the questions is uh, in the chat was, you know, will, will then these um, purpose-driven organizations be companies that uh, attract more people? We, we believe so. And, and this is somehow the, uh, what Josh is also saying here is that their irresistible organization will be an organization that today is much broader than just being big organization, just being, you know, financially uh, healthy as well. Um, and being able to pay to pay salaries at the end of the day. So meaningful work, strong management, positive workplace, health and well-being, growth opportunities and trust are um, some of the dimensions um, that, um, that, that, that will build this irresistible organization moving forward. So, um, and, and so that we can also jump to the, the, the questions. Um, some of the questions were around, what are the skills um, that we, uh, that we see are needed. Uh, one big caveat, um, I think, as you know, uh, it also depends on the culture of the company that you want to create. So it's very company driven. Um, but all the conversations that we had and, and we knew um, uh, as well that it is here knows, all the conversations that we had uh, was showcasing the fact that the most, uh, the, the highest levels of engagements and retention in the organizations were those where you had leaders, CEOs, and, and, and senior leaders that were demonstrating this, this human side of leadership. Um, and you can see a little bit of a parallel where you, could, you see more the kind of the older paradigm where the focus was basically driven, the, driving the financial performance of a company, where right now, everything that we're seeing, the evolution is uh, driving the, 
the, the, the, the, the, the multi dimensions that you see there, driving the people, helping the people to be able to deliver the value that the company needs to deliver as well. So we, we talk about uh, empathy. I think it was probably one of the words that was most used, one of the buzzwords that was most used um, in the past 18 months. Uh, we, we talked about the active listening. We talked about the, the, the purpose, the mission, um, uh, and, and ultimately the, the, what I believe is, is what distinguishes and differentiates us from, uh, you know, from everything else. We had all these human uh, skills um, that, we, that, we, that we need and that we believe are needed as well. One of the analogies that, one of the things that I said the other day to a friend of mine was, and I have three kids and, and one of them is, you know, we'll go to, the, to college um, next year and you know, in a few years to the, to, the, um, to the market, to the labor market, right? And my views of what would be the companies that I would recommend my daughter, my oldest daughter to work on actually changed uh, in the past five years or so. And I think uh, most probably before I would say, listen, try to go to some of the big companies and, and, and the Amazons and the Apples and the Microsofts and all that stuff. Right now, I would not only go with, with, you know, go with big, go with techie. I would say go to companies that have a good track record of making the right decisions and the right decisions, not only financially, but the right decisions for, um, for, uh, for the world, the right decisions for, um, for their communities um, and for their societies as well. So this is the, my, my, my summary and what I wanted to share with you, some of my views of, about the future, trying to understand what, where we are, what is the world that we are, um, and giving you a perspective of what, where we, this group of um, uh, senior leaders, um, talent leaders, learning leaders believe is somehow the trend um, that is driving us towards these more human-centered organizations and therefore uh, human-centered leadership as well. So that's it for me, Nick. Perfect, perfect. So thanks, uh, you know, for for providing context uh, uh, for for human-centered uh, leadership. Um, there are a number of slides, of a number of uh, questions in the chat. But let, let me start actually with a question that I uh, that I wrote down. Um, one related to um, you know massive turnover, new skills needs to be developed, etc. And um, your role at Mars is you are responsible for strategic capability development. And one of the, the, the challenges that many uh, organizations are facing, and also uh, those of us who are in L&D and HR, is how do you assess uh, capability gaps, right? So how do you know kind of, you know, first what you have, and then the question is, what do you need? Uh, so how are you doing that at Mars? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's multiple questions there, um, uh, Nick. I think there's... So I can tell you how we're trying to do this, um, and it's been it's been only twelve months. So there's a there's a big journey ahead of us. Um, we we would like to start small. Uh, right now, we believe that we need to equip Mars with an ability to actually translate business strategy into capability strategy. Um, so far, we've been very very somehow. Um, intuitive on the way that we say, listen, we need digital, we need agile, we need uh, innovation, right? The question is then to whom, how much, how far do we need to go and where do we need to focus, right? Because we, we don't have resources to go everywhere. So um, it's right on time. So, and, and I, I, I believe we have one, one person from Mars University also here. Um, we are creating or reinforcing an expertise on not only on capability building, because that's what we've been doing at Mars University for the past 15 years, but we are reinforcing an expertise on capability assessment. Um, so, and we don't wanna assess everything. We want to start assessing for the things that are strategically important for the business. So before, um, and, and it's a long ended answer, apologies, uh, Nick, but before we were talking about kind of workforce planning, headcount planning, right? That was trying to see for the 150,000 people of Mars, what do we need? We will shift a little bit that, that, that uh, strategy. We'll eventually do headcount planning for financial purposes, but for our strategic capabilities, we will start to understand what is our business imperative. So I'm going to tell, so if one thing that is critical for us is to um, diversify our marketing, our digital channels in marketing, 
what are the specific skills to whom will we need? And then we're gonna focus there. So one, we're gonna increase the expertise that we didn't have so that we are able to translate. We'll be more strategic to understand what are the two, three things that will be uh, you know, dr driving most of the value for Mars. And then we're gonna deep dive. We're gonna understand what are those roles? What are they doing today? But you know, there's, there's companies also um, telling you uh, what will be the roles that will be obsolete in the future? What parts of these activities will, will exist? Skills that, 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 that we will need in the future that we don't have. So we will deconstruct the roles, um, how they are done today, and we will reconstruct them with additional insights of how they need to be done in, the, in five years. So doing this deeper dive will give us the, the perspective to what are the skills that are more strategically important? How big is the gap? And hopefully drive a decision on what are we gonna do about it? Are we going to buy, build, or, or borrow the capabilities that we need? For those that we need to build, then we have our, our Marcy team that will uh, help us build those capabilities as well. Yeah, so thanks uh, Nuno, uh, Nuno for, for, um, for your perspective on this. It's a, it's a big theme for many, for many people. Um, uh, one thing uh, related to that is um, we, we spoke about this before um, a couple of months when we had a call about, about this topic. Um, you know, if we talk about, if we think about the future ready organization um, and we think about the needs for people, um, for personal development, personal growth, uh, etc. And we look at traditional, let's say, uh, corporations, large corporations. Um, you know, at large corporations, there are a lot of, you know, roles, many roles. Uh, HR went very detailed, right? So let's, let's let define every single role. Uh, let's identify the capabilities and skills, you know, which are part of the role. Let's hire people, let's develop them uh, and to keep them in, in the roles they are in. And I know that you have been done some thinking and reflecting on the roles at Mars, right? So can you say something about what's the direction when you think about, you know, where Mars is going uh, and also the roles that, you know, that have been in place? So, so yes, so uh, <laughs> the, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of, and I'm not talking about Mars, but in many other companies as well, there's, a, there's HR data is a challenge. You know, we, I think we all know this. Um, the other day I was, um, without, without sharing the name, the other day I was talking with the chief learning officer of a company and that person was telling me, listen, we have, um, we have more than 100,000 jobs and we have less than 70,000 people, right? So there's, um, at Mars, we also, we are working and we are implementing also Workday and this is public information. And in the implementation of Workday, we are actually streamlining and reducing from double digits of thousands of roles to single digits of thousands of roles. So one of the things that was decided by, uh, before my arrival was the simplification. Um, and that driving that simplification to a finite number of and controllable and manageable number of roles will allow us to actually be able to much faster understand who these people are, uh, to cluster those the skills there and actually do one thing with, which is also to, uh, to benchmark um, externally as well. One of the things that we are trying to do and, and forgive me with the commercial here, uh, we haven't worked with them yet, but the concept is phenomenal. Uh, there's, a, there's a company called Fathom. Um, there's an Australian company. And what do they do? They, they ultimately have, they've developed uh, an artificial in, uh, 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 engine and, and an, uh, an algorithm that, that feeds from, from thousands and, and thousands of data sources. And their business, their, what they want to do is trying to understand uh, in the organization, what are the roles? What, what, is, what is the likelihood of obsolescence of the role? So if a clerk... Um, in the bank, or if someone that is running SAP transactions, what is the likelihood of this role to be obsolete in the future? Or for an HR leader, for a learning leader, what is the, 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 the likelihood that this will be obsolete or that will be augmented in the future? How will this role will be done in the future? So these types of technology is, is only something that we can work once we have, we clean our house, right? Once we understand what are the roles that we have and that, that we have a good handle of this. If we have 140,000 jobs, which is not the case at, at Mars, but the other company I was talking about, um, 
and 70,000 people, then, then you, if there's no way that you'll be able to understand what, what, we, what you need. So, so yeah, we will be working much more first at a job level um, when we're doing the capability assessment, the assessing of the needs, and we will definitely be working on the individual level when we'll um, do the development of those capabilities, of course. Thanks, uh, thanks, Nuno. I have a question uh, in the chat from, uh, from Joe Carella, um, dialing in from the United States. Uh, and, and Joe is saying, well, there's a tension that I see in, in the US, uh, the idea of the irresistible organization a pitted against the gig economy and the desire for workers not to be tied to an organization that workers see as human centered when it's when we are, when we're living good times but you know but not necessarily anymore when there are challenging times right so so that kind of dilemma right so how as an organization do you indeed build a culture uh, different culture where you're able to attract and retain people in good times and bad times and stick to your kind of philosophy of human-centered leadership? I think, I think it's even more important when we do that because as, uh, as a company, for example, that leverages a lot of contractors, that means that you have people that are a smaller, so smaller amounts of time with you. So you have less ability to actually demonstrate and engage them in less opportunities to do that. So um, I would argue and I have no data to support this, that whether you are a company that is that the vast majority you have kind of associates and employees full time, or you are a company that has these a lot of contractors, you still need to do the right thing for the society, for this, for the associates and for everybody, right? So being this, the, the, the thing here is that the contractors also have the, the power of choice. So if you're, if you are as a contractor would say, you know, listen, I'm going to go to this company, um, and I have the choice to go to this company or to the other, then I'm going to go to the companies that actually treat me well, the companies that have a good track record of, of treating um, not only contractors, but associates well, the companies that are actually doing good work in society and the companies that are doing good work in nature and so on and so forth. So uh, I think it's like, you know, uh, it's like with my, the education of my kids, I need them to be regardless of who they will marry, if they will marry in the future, I need them to be good people. I need them to be irresistible people, good people with principles. It's the same thing with your organizations. They're, you know, it's living beings one way or the other. If you are an irresistible organization, it means that you do the right thing. And there's a level of trust here that if you do the right thing, people will, would like to continue to work and partner with you, whether you are an associate or an employee and or a contractor as well. Yeah, thanks, Nuno. Uh, another question related to this human leadership, um, you know, centered, human centered leadership. And, you know, a lot of people talk about leadership today, and some talk about we need to have adoptive leaders or positive leaders or transformational leaders, uh, human leaders. Um, everybody talks about we need to change leadership in our organization. Uh, now, what are you doing at Mars? to you know change or develop um your your leaders um what are some of the key you know things that you know you hope that will be different uh moving forward and how do you develop them so so we are in early stages of my stay here at mars we are one of the projects that we are leading is is around um the creation of a leadership profile nick um when, when I got here, um, and, and I think, you know, Mars is a company with more than 100 years, and it's a culture that has been evolving through in, in a lot of the principles that were coming and given um, and shared by, by the family. We have five principles um, that are, have been guiding us, our culture, um, in, um, you know, since the, 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 the past decades as well, and that, there we remain very strong. So we are right now, of course, um, having programs that, that, that as any other company tackle some of the uh, leadership skills that we believe are, are most critical, um, kind of the, the basics of management for the, for the managers, the, the senior leaders uh, uh, transitions as well uh, as many other companies do uh, in terms of uh, the evolution. Um, by the end of this year, and, and you know, if uh, the folks would love to you know, if in 12 months we are able to have this conversation again, I'll be able to tell you, well, listen, this is the leadership profile of Mars. This is where we want to go. This yeah. is how big we believe, this is the gap that we have. This is where we are 
and 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 this is how we're planning to 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 build right now we are delivering what any other corporate university delivers um, you know basics of management uh, following the transitions from individual contributors to managers to managers of managers to senior leaders um, we're trying to have a red thread um, uh, of of those of those um, of those leadership traits um, but it's 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 less uh, intentional um, in, in it's it, we will need to bring this kind of red thread moving forward so so yeah um, funded and, and based on, on these mutuality principles, on the five principles that I was talking to you about, the quality, the responsibility, and so on, um, we are um, building those programs for, for our senior leaders while we try to understand, as we all are, what is, what is, what are the, what is the profile of the leader of tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks, Nuno. Um, another question, um, if I think about Mars, you, know, you, have a, you have different, you know, as in many organizations, different segments of, of, um, of people. You have the, the, the white collar, the, the blue collar. Um, you have people who can easily find another role. Uh, there are people who might have a role and their competencies might become obsolete over the next five years. So one question, what's your, uh, from a Mars perspective, your philosophy, you mentioned it, make or buy, right? So, and particularly when it comes to, let's say, uh, blue collar workers, and you might say, wow, you know, their role is changing in five years from now, you know, 50% of their roles might become obsolete. How do you deal with that in your organization? What, what's, what's the thinking about it from leadership? Yeah, so, so Mars is a company that is well known by its developer. A lot of the, a lot of the people that I, that, that, uh, uh, that I meet um, have been here for more than a decade, some of them two or three decades. Um, and that is a demonstration of the strong culture that Mars has and also the, the, the development opportunities that we have. So when you're talking about buy, build, borrow, um, Mars is one of those companies, and again, I'm biased, that has this track record of doing the right thing. So the more, the more we can build, the more we can upskill, the more we can, we can reskill, we, that's, that's, that's our kind of, uh, seems to be our prefer preference. And, and granted, I've been here only for a year, so I'm 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 I'm, I'm building my perspective about um, about Mars. Um, the reality, though, yet is that we still don't know what will be or if there will be any impact on um, on our workforce. That's exactly what we're trying to understand. One of the things that I uh, I believe I was hired for um, was to bring this intentionality that I mentioned before, Nick. Uh, and, and the first thing of intentionality is to say, okay, we're going to reskill or upskill this group of people because there, there's a need. We still don't know what that need is. So we know that with the World Economic Forum, everybody says, you know, there's a significant amount of uh, reskilling and upskilling for the future. Um, we are on our journey right now for in the next six to eight to 12 months, be able to have a little bit more clarity of, of how big the reskilling needs to be done. My confidence is that um, Mars will do everything in our power to be able to equip our associates and long-term associates to do that job or any other job that uh, where they have transferable skills as well. That's something that will be important, um, even when we're talking about the job roles, is to understand what are the transferable skills from one, one job to the other. Um, that will help you eventually, if you need to reskill and reposition, um, the, 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 uh, some of these jobs um, to understand where, where it's closer and where it's better to, um, to reskill to. Thanks, so, you know, I have two questions left. One is actually from, um, you know, from Mubarak in the chat, and he asked a question about, you know, what do you, what do you in your life outside of work uh, do that is very inspiring for you? So a little bit the, the personal uh, Nuno, you know, right? So, uh, um, and how do you keep learning as a person? That's kind of one question I have, and then I have a last one. So, so I'm I'm an absolute junkie and cur curious person, junkie in terms of knowledge. Um, so one of the things that was transformation, I think um, Nick mentioned. I, I've I went to Stanford um, in 2018, and and you know what you you know you had a good career, or you think you have a good career, and then then you get to Stanford, and you're in the middle of 150, 200 uh, people that all of them have, has, have done much more than what you've ever will do for, the, for work, for society, for, and it's a humbling experience. It's a really humbling experience. 
So, so since then, one of the things that for me is most, most, most inspiring is that I'm, um, I'm working and you know, one of the things that you mentioned, I've, we, I've had the opportunity to co-found um, an investment uh, company. Um, so we are uh, a company of other Stanford alumni that is investing in small um, companies that are trying to change the world and through technology and companies that have uh, the intention to be able to bring and generate a better world for us in the future. Um, where through technology, where um, uh, whether it's making our life easier and better or having a societal impact, both at a human level or at um, uh, uh, an economic level as well. So that's probably some of the things that we're, I'm doing that I think is most inspiring. Uh, I am trying to diversify my corporate experience by trying to invest with my time as well uh, to support these small startups so that they can be uh, sustainable and actually do what they need to do. So it's a small contribution, um, but that's, um, uh, that's what I'm trying to do, Mubarak, uh, for, for the society. No, wonderful. It's, it's very inspiring. Um, and, you know, thank you for, for, for sharing that. I think it's uh, for all of us always like, how can we contribute to society? It's so important. Um, my last question, Nuno, most of us in, the, in the, the, the session today, and people will listen to the recorded session, uh, are leaders, professionals in HR, L&D, leadership development. Based on your 25 years of experience and based where we are today in, in, in the world, um, any advice you, know, you have for, for all of us as professionals Listen, uh, I heard, I read somewhere, I don't know the source, but I'll, I'll find it that 2019 or 2020 was the year of the CIO, that 2021 is the year of the chief HR officer. Um, so the CIO, because of all the technology changes, chief HR officer, because of all these pandemic uh, aspects and, and all that. My take is the next year's is the chief learning officer. Um, and because we will be needing to reskill and upskill a lot of a lot of the workforce, um, that comes with a lot of responsibility, Nick. Um, and if the numbers tells us anything, is that we're investing three hundred and fifty billion dollars a year in learning and development, and the return is very small. So the 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 any advice is tough. Um, really try to be. To, to go where, where, you know, to focus. Try to focus on the things that are really most important for your organizations, right? Um, the things that will drive, the 20% that will drive the 80% of the value. We, we normally spend the 80% of the, of the efforts on the 20%. Let's try to revert that. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We, we want to be closer to the strategy and understand that strategy so that we're able to translate that strategy even better. So I don't think it's, there's no rocket science. There's $350 billion that are going out the door. The return is low. Can we do better? Yes, we can. How can we do better? Understanding better the business, translating their needs better into focus and not just doing learning for the sake of, of, of learning, which, which you know sometimes we do um, as well. No. Thanks. I can't agree more, uh, Nuno, in terms of the focus. Um, and I think as, as a number of us are in our leaders in L&D, uh, leadership development, uh, one thing I like to add to this is uh, in order to make sure that we have a high, you know, kind of a high impact of what we do is to look at evidence based practices. And I always say, um, you know, finance is a profession with people with deep, deep expertise in finance. The same applies for IT. If you want to appoint your chief technology officer, it's somebody who understands technology. So from an, a learning CLO perspective, the same thing. And learning is a very deep science, actually. There are many disciplines contributing to developing people and designing programs and measuring impact. And I think the more we can you know, leverage evidence-based practices, the higher impact that we have in, in our organizations. 
So, um, Nuno, again, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Uh, you know, we will be in touch. You are linked also to, to the programs that we are offering. Thank you so much for, for sharing your, your thoughts today. Everybody, thank you for, for listening. Thank you for your questions. Um, we look forward to seeing you back uh, next month with an, a, you know, a new upcoming webinar. So, uh, wish you all the best and uh, take care. Thank you for having me, Nick.